Staying with the markets now, let's get some tips on where to invest your hard-earned cash in 2024. Keith Fitzgerald is the principal of the Fitzgerald Group, an investment advisory firm based in Seattle on the west coast of the United States. He stayed up late to speak to us and he joins us now live. Morning, Keith. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. So let's start with the bigger picture. Bumper year for U.S. stocks in 2023. 24% increase for the main index, the S&P 500. There are those, perhaps myself included, who think that the U.S. stock market is now perhaps a little bit overvalued and we've missed the train. But you think otherwise. I do think otherwise. There are a number of factors here that are not logical. They're not comfortable. And I think they're going to catch a lot of people by surprise. There may be five, eight, even $10 trillion on the sidelines. The Fed is going to get benched mid-year in 2024. And finally, AI, which came into the public consciousness in good measure in 2023, I think is going to come into its own as companies begin to leverage that worldwide, the impact of which is going to be trillions of dollars to the positive side as that introduces the lexicon. Well, let's talk about a couple of those bigger picture themes first of all. You mentioned the Federal Reserve there, uh, but also your thesis. I was looking at your, your website this morning, Five with Fits, and you say there will be more profits created in the next 10 years than the last 50 combined. I like that quote. Another quote of yours that I like from a recent TV interview you did. You've been critical of the Fed for the past few months on this show and others. You say the Fed is so far out to lunch it's an insult to people who are out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, and here's the thing, right? They are not stupid. They're actually very, very intelligent individuals. The problem that the Fed has is the same as many other central banks around the world. They are playing with financial models and statistics that were created to measure a manufacturing economy that no longer exists. So when you have the blossoming of digital knowledge and digital transformation like we have today, these models are not only trapped in the past, but they are rearward looking. What the central banks around the world need to be doing, including the Fed, is they need to be looking forward and they need to be making strategic decisions. Because if they were doing that, we would have a very different calculus on hand. So if we are going to make more wealth in the next 10 years than the past half a century, happy days, the question is, how do we capture it, whether we're sitting in Seattle like you or, or Dubai like us? And one of the debates you've been weighing into is the passive investment, buying ETF tracker funds, versus active investment. And it's got quite heated lately, hasn't it? And you have strong views on this. I do. You know, the, the interesting thing is diversification has worked for a very long period of time, but it has not worked for the last decade. And the reason is this is a lot like buying cable television, for example. You've got to buy one channel that you really don't want to watch to get the two or three that you do. And so if you're going to index, you're probably going to do OK. But the rise of passive investing is actually holding many investors back. That's why Warren Buffett doesn't do it. That's why Ray Dalio doesn't do it. That's why Ron Barron doesn't do it. That's why I don't do it. If you can pick the best companies in their space, the ones that are growing, that make must-have products and services, then it stands to reason you are going to do considerably better than the indices. That's where I weigh in on the audience. The danger is, though, that some people will get their investment advice and start stock picking on Instagram or TikTok, and you've warned of the rise of the so-called Finfluencer. Oh, my goodness. This is a terrible conundrum for many, many people because, you know, the, the Internet has given everybody with a, a camera and a microphone a voice. And, you know, that's great on many levels. But a recent study from Switzerland, in fact, found that they reviewed, I think, 29,000 Finfluencers. We call them furus. 56% gave anti-skilled advice, meaning they gave advice to their viewers, readers, and watchers that was directly contrary to sound financial principles in the financial markets. So, you know, the Internet that unfortunately has unleashed a torrent of bad information. But the good thing for savvy investors is there's actually a very straight, direct path forward. This isn't rocket science. There's a very select group of companies that are at the very top of their game. Those are the ones that are going to be there in 5, 10, 15 years when you need your money. They're the ones that are going to create the profits, not the companies that are out on the margin. Well, let's talk about some of those. You are staying with tech. You like Apple. You like Microsoft. 
Absolutely, without a doubt. Apple is very straightforward. They are introducing things that we couldn't have even dreamed of 10, 20 years ago. They can add billions of dollars to the top line at the touch of a button because of the ecosphere. The iPhone is not a phone. The iPhone is a sensor platform. It's going to handle medicine. It's going to handle your life. It's going to handle your banking. It's going to handle your hotel, your car, all sorts of things in the future. Microsoft's taking the opposite tact. It's going with AI. They're not a company that's about software like people think. They're about bringing the world together. Together. And they're doing it with AI being introduced through all of their platforms, their word processing, their jobs, their smart boards. All of that is going to work together. So these two companies are at the very top, the very pinnacle <laughs> of where investors should be thinking about things. A gesundheit to my colleague Brandy Scott in the studio. It is very cold in here this morning. We've got a couple more minutes with you. In terms of the artificial intelligence trend, you mentioned that at the top of the hour. How do we play this? Do we bust just buy shares of NVIDIA, the chip maker? What do we do? Well, that's an interesting one. You know, you can go after the needle or you can go after the haystack, right? You know, so I believe that AI has got a couple different facets. People are making a mistake right now. It's going to cost them dearly. They're thinking about it just as another technology. But in fact, it's an enabler. It is going to impact every industry from your gas station to your laundromat to all of the big tech companies. You can buy the chips. You can buy the software. You can buy the cloud. This is the perfect nexus. We've been, we don't see this, but once in our investing life, lifetimes, maybe twice if we're lucky. This is on par with the introduction of penicillin, electricity, distributed power, even the internet itself. Finally, let's get to what you're calling the buy of the decade, a stock that you think uh -huh. is so unloved and so undervalued that it is a screaming buy. It's a household name, but it is not a technology company. I shall let you, Keith, announce your buy of the decade. Oh, you're very kind. So this is possibly the most hated stock on Wall Street, certainly among the most hated here in the United States at the moment, but it is on the verge of becoming a tech company. This is Pfizer. It is one of the world's largest pharmacological companies. It made headlines for all of its COVID-related shenanigans. Now, some people like that, some people don't, but they're developing a tremendous oncology portfolio. They've got hundreds of drugs in the pipeline. They've got a number of more specifically related to oncology. We're on the verge of solving many of humanity's most challenging problems. I think this company is so beaten up, so beaten down, that it can't help but go up, particularly if you look at where the world's health situation is today. But why has Pfizer performed so badly? We mentioned over the past year, the S&P 500 is up by 24%. Pfizer is down by 44%. I know it, you know, and I own it. I'm not particularly pleased with the way it's performing, but also this all this depends on perspective, right? This is one of those stocks that got way ahead of itself because of COVID, and now with all of the other investing themes out there, the technology, the cybersecurity, defense industry, there are simply better places to put your money. So you got two choices as an investor. You can bail out, which is what the weak money has done, or you can look behind the scenes and the strong money continues to buy. So I'm content to hopefully buy more shares. I hope I'm smart enough to do that because one of these days, the attention is going to turn right back to companies like Pfizer. Keith, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you staying up late to speak to us today. The thoughts of Keith Fitzgerald joining us live from Seattle there. He is with the Fitzgerald. Hi, it's Keith here. Thanks for checking out today's highlight clip. What'd you think? Did I make sense? Is there something you'd like to add? Make sure you leave a comment down below and of course, click subscribe to keep up right here on YouTube or sign up for the email newsletter at the link below. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram for my real-time thoughts on markets, analysis, and a whole lot more.